We have Tim Legler with us to break this all down. Legs, what do you think of that 76ers comeback win? What was your big takeaway? Uh, maybe their best win of the year because they dug deep late and they did it against a really good team. And Philadelphia did it in a way offensively that I think is going to pay them big dividends in the playoffs where Joel Embiid doesn't have to be the guy to make the call late in the game. You could go other places. And Tobias Harris came up in a big way from the right corner at a couple of threes. James Harden had a couple of big buckets down the stretch. Embiid overall had a great stat line, but he'll admit it wasn't necessarily his best night offensively. And yet, they still won the game. So when you have a team like Memphis and they've got you down double digits late with their guard play, typically that's going to be a done deal. Um, but Philadelphia did it with their defense first, incredible rim protection on the part of Embiid. They contested everything on the perimeter to fight back to give themselves a chance. And then you had other guys settle the score at the other end of the floor. And that, to me, really is going to spell the difference for the Sixers in the postseason. It can't be Embiid possession after possession late in games because he's a seven-footer and you can take the ball out of his hands if you want to defensively. So it's got to come from somewhere else in the pressure moments and he got that help last night that he needed. You mentioned the postseason. I think that's where we're looking right now, right? It's, it's March is next week, so we're getting to the point where this is that time of year. The Celtics and the Bucks at the top of the East. Can the Sixers be a problem for either or both of those teams? No doubt that would be an incredible second-round series. I mean, Philadelphia can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with either of those teams in a series. Milwaukee-Boston seem like they're on a collision course for the conference finals, but the one team that could disrupt that is Philadelphia. And it's going to come down to the things I just said. You know, not letting it depend solely on a Joel Embiid or a James Harden in those moments. Can you get supplemental offense from a Maxi, from a Tobias Harris in big moments? And then... For me, it's always going to really lay at the feet of James Harden because he's got the ball so much and he has had struggles in the postseason in big spots in those series-defining type games where he has not played well offensively or has not really looked aggressive offensively. Hard to overcome that if James Harden plays that way. But they've got the talent to get to the finals. They've just got to handle those pressure moments when they get there against either Milwaukee or Boston. Well, I'll tell you what, they are going to score, Graz. They had a 140-point game last night. There's probably more 140-point games coming this regular season. Not sure about coming in the playoffs, and that's really the key. Can this team defend enough? My God, can they score, though? The back and forth last night was incredibly impressive, and they're just getting going. Tim, we talked earlier about the 76ers' big comeback last night against Memphis. What was your takeaway from that? I just think that we forget sometimes that Philly's right there in the mix of Boston and Milwaukee. This might have been their best win of the season. Down double digits in the fourth quarter against a really good team on a night when Joel Embiid wasn't his best offensively, and they still found a way to get stops and got a lot of help from Tobias Harris down the stretch. Great win for Philly. Wendy, the Lakers dominated the Warriors last night. Are they back on track? <laughs> Well, back to what? Back to being in 12th place? No, I think the big thing here, LeBron had a poor game, and they were able to win. And that is not something that we could have said almost at all during this season for the Lakers. They've needed LeBron for everything. So this is a good indication that their depth has vastly improved with these trades. Obviously, a, a lot of changes in L.A., and it seems like early returns indicate uh, that they're for the better. Legs, what did you take away from that Lakers victory over uh, Golden State last night? Uh, I, I don't think you can overstate the impact of Malik Beasley, not only last night, but going forward. He was a perfect fit. When they made the acquisition, it, it made total sense to improve their spacing and flow. And he made seven threes last night, but he's a lot more than a three-point shooter. He's a guy that you can run sets for to get his own offense. And he also competes on the other end of the floor. Just, it just you know, one of those moves made at the trading deadline that if you think it's, you're getting back a role player, but he can be a lot more than that on a lot of nights. And Wendy mentioned it. LeBron not only didn't play well, Anthony Davis only took five shots in this game. Uh, they got 68 points off their bench, plus what you got out of Malik Beasley as a starter. So for me, that's what the big takeaway was. Is this team going to fit better going forward with Beasley and D'Angelo Russell? I think the early signs are absolutely. Wendy, what does that tell you that they were able to win like that without getting much from LeBron and AD? Yeah, since I'm in Phoenix, I'll just tell you, LeBron feels like a desert flower, parched, 
for spacing, like, like a desert flower for water. How about that for an analogy? Look at the difference it makes when LeBron James has some spacing and shooting around him. This is the type of team, the type of, of situation that LeBron thrives in, even when he doesn't play well. Malik Beasley stretches the floor, and he provides a margin for error. And if it's not Beasley, it could be D'Angelo Russell, who last night had to leave the game with a sprained ankle. Getting other options to take the pressure off of LeBron and Anthony Davis changes the world for the Lakers. They're not a championship team, but this is a playoff-style roster, and a playoff team wins games when their stars are not great, like, like, just like last night. Playoff team, not a championship team. So, like, what's in between that, Brian? Like, can they, can they make life difficult for some of the playoff teams in the West? Yeah, I mean, the West is so wide open. I mean, even Golden State, they're 7-23 and 23 on the road. So this result wasn't really a surprise. But Golden State feels like they can win if they're healthy. The Lakers, if they're healthy, feel like they've got a puncher's chance. But I would just say that this roster that they've got right now is a roster that is a top six roster, in my opinion, in the Western Conference. Whether there's enough time left for them to crawl into that for the postseason, that's what we're all going to be tuned into. What do you think, Legs? What kind of team are the Lakers as presently constituted? Yeah, I think they're dangerous. I, I don't think they're a team that you'd want to see in the first round if you're Denver or Memphis. I mean, neither one of those franchises have accomplished, you know, what they've wanted to here recently by getting to a final or in the case of Memphis, a conference final. So you have two teams with relative playoff inexperience or, or lack of success taking on a team like the Lakers. If, if they're healthy and they're able to escape the play-in, which I think they're ultimately destined for, if they get out of that, that means they've played well down the stretch and they won a couple of important pressure-packed games probably to get to that point. And now that's your reward if you're Denver for being the best team in the West all year to play the Lakers in the first round. That's scary, I think, for Memphis as well. There's a lot of teams coming there in the bottom half of the Western Conference playoffs that nobody's going to want to see that are different teams. Phoenix, Dallas, the Clippers added guys at the break, and Kawhi Leonard's healthy now, and then the Lakers. So you've got a lot of teams coming for those top-seeded teams in the first round of the playoffs. It's going to be fascinating. I don't think they can get to a final or make a run through the West, and I wouldn't pick them to beat Denver. Denver, but I think they could give Denver a long series. Newly acquired superstar Kevin Durant has begun scrimmaging with the team, uh, and Devin Booker, his new teammate, uh, has had some high praise for what he's seen in those scrimmages. Take a listen. It's a real problem. Like I said, just less attention on each one of us. It makes it a lot easier. A lot of teams have one good defender or two good defenders, and you know, now you're going to have to try to find, you know, put them who you're going to put them on. Legs, it all sounds and looks good. How long do you think it'll take for the Phoenix Suns to, to gel and come together? It'll be pretty quick with Kevin Durant. He's just one of those guys that's not worried about people changing what they do to acquiesce to him. He's so efficient. He's going to step on the court day one when they start to play together, and he's going to get to his number, and he's going to do it in a highly efficient manner. So it's a luxury to add a guy like that uh, that you don't have to change a lot of what you're doing. It'll come together quickly. Um, and I think this team, I was looking at first thinking they're not deep enough. But the more you look into it, they've got a Torrey Craig and a Josh and Kogi to, to pick up some of that defensive slack you lose with Miles Bridges. I think that was really what I was concerned about. I think those guys can do the job there. So I think the depth is going to be there. But the starting five is going to be so good and so dynamic and so fast. Right now, Denver would win a seven-game series against Phoenix. Let's see if you ask me that question in a month. I may have a different answer once Kevin Durant reminds people of what he's capable of and how quickly this comes together in Phoenix. Wendy, you're with the Suns in Phoenix today. What can you tell us about Durant's fit with the team? So yesterday, Graz, they had a two-hour practice, their longest practice since training camp. They brought in referees to referee the scrimmage to make it as game-like as possible. And they were trying to suppress smiles when we came in there because I think they thought it went so good. They wanted to keep expectations low, but there you can feel an energy and a buzz around them. Devin Booker's arms were all cut up because the scrimmage was so intense that they were cutting each other. But he is really excited to play with Kevin Durant. And one thing I'm going to point out, the offensive system that the Suns have in place is a system designed to take advantage of side pick and rolls and elbow action because that's what Chris Paul and Devin Booker do. Guess whose bread and butter play for, for a decade plus has been those types of plays? 
Kevin Durant. They're not even going to have to alter their sets. They're just going to stick him into plays. He's been running his whole career, and I think they're going to take off fast. And Durant is specifically making sure he's in good physical condition. I think he's not going to play until next Wednesday at Charlotte. Two times he has had midseason MCL sprains. He knows exactly how to come back from this injury. Two times he's come back spectacular. I expect it to happen again. It, it all sounds extremely exciting. What both of you guys are talking about sounds extremely exciting, and obviously it, it looks like it's going to be great uh, on paper. Are they, I mean, Wendy, should they be the favorites in the West if it all comes together the way we expect it to? Look, Denver is and should be the favorites. I watched them last night just play spectacularly in Cleveland against a good team having a good night without one of their better players in Aaron Gordon. They are a well-oiled machine. To beat Denver without home court advantage where they are the number one team in the league, you're going to have to be buttoned down. But they are not a team that is menacing. They have weaknesses. And I think there's some teams in the West, particularly the Warriors and Suns, that if they hit their top gear, can, can beat them. And that's why the Western Conference playoffs are going to be fascinating. Legs, you said ask you again in a week or a month uh, about the Suns versus the Nuggets. So, like, let's play it out. Like, if it all comes together the way you're expecting, are the Suns going to go into the playoffs as the team that, you know, is, is title or bust? Would it be a disappointment if they don't win? I think there's a good chance we're going to feel that way by the time we get there. You know, I said if they played Denver today in a playoff series, they would lose that series. The good news for Phoenix, they don't have to. They've got almost two months to come together and to find their ebb and flow offensively. I talk about that all the time, but it's so important when you add a guy like Kevin Durant uh, to a guy like Devin Booker, they've got to sort through that, and that might take a little bit of time. But once they hit their stride, I just don't know that there's an answer for everything that they can bring offensively. They've got a dominant big in the middle that basically finishes everything he touches in DeAndre Ayton. So you're going to have to pay attention to the paint on any sort of pick and roll action where you get double teams. And then the best part of their games, Kevin Durant's one of the best mid-range players in the history of this league. Guess what? Devin Booker is one of the best mid-range players of his generation. And that's important in the postseason because the three can abandon you some nights. And it's not always easy to get to the line or get to the paint. But that mid-range area of the floor is always available to great scorers. And those two guys do it as well as anybody in the league. And Chris Paul is a great mid-range player. And the best part of all this, Chris Paul can be preserved offensively and pick his spots when they need him. He doesn't have to carry the load. And that will wear his body down like it has in the past. He can pick his spots of when he needs to take take over games. That's the real blessing in this, having a guy like Chris Paul be fresh when you need him most. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.